So I think most of us are getting pretty good at Zoom, so we know what we need to do. So um, as you know, a few is really involved with the native plant um, sale. Uh, this will be our third year of having it, and that is June 12th. And right now on our website, you can uh, pre-order garden flats and grasses and sedges. And then on June 12th, you'll have an opportunity to pick those up. And also uh, Garrett will be bringing uh, quite a few more plants. So uh, that's from I think nine to 12. It's on our website. Um, so we have that going. And then next week we have in the morning at, at 10 o'clock, we're gonna pull more garlic mustard in Cartier Park. We, there's still lots there. If you're wanting to do that, it's real easy. The garlic mustard pulls right out. It's not pokey or anything like that. So, and then also at that night, we have a program on solar. It's called Solar 101, but it's also um, for solar for the home, which a lot of people are, are getting right now. So, and then we have a beat sweep on May 19th and all our events are on the website and we have the Facebook group and a page. So hopefully we will see some of you around. And um, Garrett's been doing the native plant sale. Well, you did, you, this is our third year with you and I think you did it for the Soil Conservation District a year before that or two years. So Correct. Yeah. Garrett has quite a, a bit of, two. yes. Garrett Noyes has a, uh, quite a bit of experience. He's the co-owner of Bird's Foot Native Nursery located north of Travers. And they grow native wildflowers, grasses, sedges, shrubs for landscape professionals, retail nurseries, and habitat restoration of efforts in, northern, in the northern part of the state. They are, committing, they are committed to applying organic practices to their operation, which we love that. And they are partners with us for the native plant sale. If it wasn't for Garrett's business, we wouldn't be able to do this. So we appreciate Garrett. So he is going to um, share his screen. He has a nice presentation. He's sitting in one of his greenhouses. So that's pretty cool right there. He's gonna show you some plants to also later on. All Thank right. you. Okay. Thank you, Julia. I'll see if I can get this going here. Okay. I think that everyone can probably see the, the slideshow now. Um, Thanks for the introduction, Julia. And uh, so my wife and I um, own and operate Bird's Foot Native Nursery. We're up in South Boardman. Uh, we've been um, growing here since about 2018 um, and uh, just grow Michigan native species, uh, perennials, grasses, shrubs, sedges, and we're largely wholesale. Uh, so we uh, provide plants for uh, plant sales like uh, we're partnering with Appio on here, as well as um, the conservation districts in our area. County conservation districts uh, have spring spring plant sales, um, uh, generally May, May and June. Uh, we also provide plants to landscape professionals, designers, and then retail operations. And then we do do some direct sales uh, to homeowners, uh, generally larger projects, uh, but you know, folks that are looking to uh, plant a shoreline or stream bank or, or put in a, you know, a larger native planting are, are more than welcome to, to give us a shout. So to start off here, if I can get this to click over. Hmm. There we go. Um, starting off, uh, you know, what is a native plant? Um, there's a lot of terms that get get thrown around in the nursery trade. Uh, you know, wildflower is something you hear a lot. Which uh, you know, wildflower is not necessarily a native plant. Uh, sort of a, a name that we've given species that are able to, uh, you know, reproduce and spread and propagate um, on their own. Uh, and then, of course, you have cultivars and native ours, uh, which we'll get into some of that a little bit later. But a native plant is a plant that has uh, adapted and evolved to uh, a specific uh, region um, or area, landscape, ecosystem, and uh, it's evolved not only to the, the climate and the conditions there, but also it's evolved uh, 
along with all the other wildlife in that area. So it's really part of that ecosystem and part of those those relationships um, and, and networks of, of food webs and, and shelter and habitat that have developed on that landscape. So here in Michigan, um, we have you know, a, a plethora of native species. Um, and really a lot of that is because we have such a diversity of habitat types in the state. So this, this map here, uh, it's a little hard to see some of the detail probably on your screen, but um, this is uh, from Michigan Natural Features Inventory. And this is a pre-settlement map of habitat types in the state. And uh, you can kind of see that tension zone, um, which stretches from Saginaw Bay and kind of runs uh, to about kind of southwest to south of, of Ludington there ways. And that's really where we start to see that transition from more southern type forests, southern and central type forests to more northern type ecosystems. Um, and that gives us a lot of diversity uh, in the northern lower uh, and the southern lower uh, uh, peninsula. And looking across the, the southern part of the state there, uh, we're where some of our prairie and savanna areas were um, originally pre-settlement. A lot of these have been developed or turned into farmland, uh, really only a few remnants remain. But, um, you know, a lot of our more prairie species that are native to the state of Michigan, uh, many of them are native to those regions. Uh, in the more northern part of the state, uh, where we started to see, you know, you see a lot of diversity, pre-settlement was in uh, a lot of these fire dominated ecosystems. So in pine and oak forests, which is a lot of that orange that you see, uh, much of those forests were, uh, you know, burned very regularly uh, just through natural processes. You had a lot of open barren or savanna areas, which are uh, largely dominated by wildflowers and grasses with scattered or mature trees. And since uh, Europeans have settled Michigan, you know, we've suppressed fire uh, in most of those areas, and it's really changed the composition of a lot of those, those landscapes. Um, and we've lost a lot of diversity accordingly, in, you know, in our more open ground, uh, barren, savanna, and prairie type, type wildflowers. So why, you know, why are they important uh, for the ecosystem and uh, for us to be growing? Uh, you know, native plants really are the foundations of those ecosystems, the foundations of the food web. Uh, really starting with, with insects um, is where that's most apparent and, uh, you know, most important. All insects, bees, beetles, flies, butterflies, skippers, moths, uh, feed on native plants, or they may be a predatory insect that feeds on insects that feed on native plants. Uh, so that, that's really where that starts. And they really are the most abundant protein source for a lot of other uh, critters out there, uh, birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians. Uh, one family of chickadees alone estimated to eat between six to 9,000 caterpillars uh, just from hatching to, to fledging. So it takes a lot of insects uh, to get these, these animals uh, going, get them, you know, growing and healthy, uh, you know, during times of nesting and when uh, young are, are growing, they really need that, that high energy protein source. And in addition, uh, you know, many species of plants uh, provide berries, seeds uh, that are, you know, very high in nutrition as well and often available at important times of year. Uh, you know, a lot of our berries on shrubs uh, start to ripen and mature late summer, early fall, when a lot of songbirds are, are preparing to migrate or trying to store up energy before winter if they're, if they're uh, year round residents. So they're you know, really critical uh, food for, for the rest of, of our critters here. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of problems with insect species uh, here in Michigan, across North America and, and worldwide. A 2019 uh, global study indicates that about 40% of insect species are in decline. And that's uh, and seeing an eight times faster extinction rate than mammals, reptiles, and birds. Um, because they're so numerous uh, and because they rely so heavily on healthy ecosystems, uh, you know, they're really the kind of the bellwether when things start to, to go wrong. And uh, there's a number of things that are being pointed to as, as starting to cause these declines, uh, you know, habitat loss, invasive species uh, that are then displacing native species and uh, the you know more common use of 
herbicides and pesticides in agriculture and really changes in, in the agricultural uh, process over the last several decades uh, have really had a big effect um, on our insect populations. And in turn, uh, songbird populations uh, have, have really been noted to decline uh, here in North America. It's about a 30% estimated decline since 1970. Some of you may be aware of the problems with invasive species. Um, you know, not only do they displace uh, native species, but uh, they also provide little to no uh, nutritional benefit uh, for much of our wildlife. Uh, so many insects uh, aren't able to feed on uh, not only invasives, but other non-native plants. Um, so, you know, if you're, you're purchasing non-native shrubs, wildflowers or grasses to, to plant in your landscape, um, you know, they're going to provide uh, little to no benefit to, to any native insects that, that might be desperately looking for uh, that type of habitat. So these are some of the ecosystem reasons why it's, it's really critical uh, to have uh, healthy native ecosystems, uh, you know, with, with an abundance and diversity of native plants in the landscape. In addition to these, uh, the reasons for, for us to be growing native plants um, versus non-native is uh, they're adapted to our climate, they're adapted to our soil types. Uh, so they're, they're really a lot easier to establish with, with less input and less maintenance. Um, you know, the roots on many of our native prairie species can be incredible, uh, up to 10, 12, even 15 foot root depth on uh, some mature plants like uh, lead plant, uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, versus turf grass like Kentucky blue stem, you're looking at about six inches of, of root depth. Uh, not only does that have some benefits, uh, you know, when it comes to holding soil in place and preventing erosion, but that really helps them uh, deal with drought uh, primarily, uh, where if you don't water your turf grass during dry periods in the summer here in Michigan, uh, you know, they'll burn up and turn brown where a lot of these native plants can, can withstand pretty severe drought uh, with, with little to no watering, uh, you know, unless they might be a species that's adapted to wetter soil. And then with our diversity that we have here in the state, you're really not limiting yourself by choosing only to grow natives. Uh, there's, we grow over a hundred species and, and we're really just scratching the surface. Um, you know, some of the larger nurseries in the state grow, grow several hundred. And uh, there's really, pretty much no limit if availability is really the challenge. Um, but there's there's the native species here in Michigan for every soil type, every type of lighting situation that you might have, um, every color, uh, bloom time from you know early spring through fall. So uh, really encourage people to not look at it as, as limiting yourself to native species, but really it's a whole, uh, whole world to explore. So getting into that a little bit more uh, and talking about trying to find native plants, a really important thing for folks uh, as consumers um, is to be aware of the use of neonicotinoid pesticides. Uh, some of you may have heard of these, they're, they're starting to get a little more press, which is great, but still not uh, nearly talked about enough. So neonicotinoids are a neurotoxin pesticide. Uh, they cause paralysis and death in insects and they are pretty uh, widely used in the nursery trade, generally in, in the large scale nursery trade. Uh, so big production nurseries and overseas nurseries uh, that are often shipping to you know, things like box stores, uh, places like that. Um, and then they may get distributed to smaller retail nurseries. And the way they work is they're a systemic pesticide. So once that plant is treated as a seedling, as it continues to grow and mature, put on new, grow new leaves, uh, flower, all those new parts of that plant also contain that toxin. Uh, so even the pollen contains the neonicotinoid toxin. And they'll persist for months and, and even possibly a couple of years. It's a thousand day half-life, um, you know, for so the neurotoxins in neonicotinoids take a long time to, to break down to where they're not harmful anymore. And what's really malicious about these is it, you know, when used on a, a flowering plant and, and uh, is that then functions as an ecological trap. Uh, you know, this, this plant uh, flowers, it blooms, it draws in, uh, you know, a butterfly or a bee to, to pollinate and then it's uh, poisoned by that toxin. 
uh, or you know maybe they lay their eggs on it and then the caterpillars begin to feed on that plant um, and they're, they're poisoned in turn. Bees and butterflies are particularly sensitive to this, um, these pesticides. Uh, they're used in agriculture a fair amount and uh, it's, it's one of the things that a lot of folks are starting to point their finger at for uh, domestic honeybee hive uh, collapses and, and problems. Uh, so that's been studied pretty widely. We really don't know the effect that they're having on our native bee populations. Um, they're not, not as widely studied. Um, but as a consumer, it's really important to make sure that you're not purchasing and planting plants that have been treated with neonicotinoids. Um, I did say that they're often in box stores. I know some box stores have been making pledges to not use, uh, not source plants that have been treated with neonics. I'm not, not exactly familiar with which ones do and which ones don't. So I don't want to uh, point that out. But as a consumer, you know, you want to take the initiative to, to research and, um, you know, make sure either it's, it's, clearly indicated on the plant that you're purchasing that it hasn't been treated with neonics or uh, speak to uh, the, you know, the retail outfit that you're buying it from and, and uh, see what their policy is on that. But um, definitely want to make sure we're not putting those plants out there. So speaking about pollinators more specifically, and, and in addition to not buying plants that have been treated with neonics, uh, you know, what do you, what do you want to do to, uh, draw in uh, pollinators and, and provide the most benefit uh, for pollinators. And what is a pollinator, I guess, is a, a better question. And, and really, uh, many uh, native insects uh, can function as pollinators, uh, moths, beetles, spiders, um, eh, butterflies. Uh, bees are really, and bees and, and, and critters in the bee family are really uh, very well adapted to function as pollinators. Um, they're set up very well for that and, and they perform most of our pollination services. We have about 450 species of native bees here in Michigan, so an incredible diversity. And what that means to us as, as gardeners is that we want that we want to try to get as much diversity in our gardens as we can uh, because a lot of these bees, uh, their specific physical makeup allows them to pollinate some plants efficiently and then some plants not at all. Uh, so, for example, uh, long-tongued bees, um, you know, are, are able to pollinate uh, some deeper tubular flowers like like uh, foxglove beer tongue or, or hairy beer tongue that uh, bees that don't have as long of a tongue might not be able to. Uh, if you look on, on the screen there in the top right, that's prairie smoke, uh, which are, are just about starting to bloom right now. And that's a bumblebee uh, pollinating that. And uh, that's a closed bloom. Uh, when they're blooming, they, they're closed like that. And bumblebees are one of the few species that are strong enough to kind of pry that bloom open and get in there and pollinate it. So to provide the most benefit, you know, really having that, that diversity is, is critical. And uh, combining early, late, mid-season blooming plants uh, is going to give you, um, you know, the most benefit to these, these insects throughout the entire growing season. So, uh, you know, starting off with, with the earliest bloomers like that prairie smoke there, and then, um, you know, capturing as much of that mid, mid summer bloom as you can, and then uh, planting goldenrods and asters like on the top left, that showy goldenrod uh, with some New England aster in the, in the fall will give you, uh, you know, pollen right, at, right till freeze up. And, um, you know, from our perspective too, that's, it's just, um, you know, a good approach to gardening as well, because it's going to give you uh, something exciting to look at uh, all through the season. And we'll dive a little more into some species, you know, species that fit into each of those uh, blocks. And grouping plants uh, when you're when you're planting uh, groups of typically three or more, um, you know, even even larger drifts, but uh, clustering your plants like that, uh, like species is going to allow pollinators to forage more efficiently. Obviously, avoiding pesticides um, and using only seedlings that are free of neonicotinoids. Uh, and I should note, you're you're gonna see some, uh, you know, you're gonna see some damage, some chewed leaves, uh, things like that on on your plants. And that's that's good. That's normal. That means they're doing their job. Uh, they're you know they're benefiting uh, our wildlife. Uh, uh, monarchs around here uh, last year were almost a bit of a pest. Um, 
we collect our own seed and uh, we had such an incredible monarch hatch last year. They were, they were just uh, mowing down our, our uh, butterfly weed and our other milkweeds. It was pretty, pretty incredible to see. Uh, luck, luckily they, they matured and, and kind of moved on before they, they wiped out uh, everything, but it was pretty incredible, but that's just part of the, you know, part of the process. Uh, avoiding, uh, and I should note that in, in a garden, you're probably not going to see that, um, you know, something of that magnitude. It's just when, when we have hundreds of flats of, of one species around, you know, is, is when you're maybe going to see that. Avoiding cultivars and hybrids uh, as much as you can. Uh, the science is kind of mixed on this, but uh, a cultivar is uh, a species that's been adapted uh, by the nursery trade by selective breeding. Oh. Um, so the way the way to tell the difference uh, as a consumer is if you see so a, a plant that is not a cultivar, a true native species, uh, has two botanical names. Um, so for uh, butterfly milkweed, that would be Asclepias tuberosa, so genus and species. A cultivar would have a third name, and it's typically some kind of trade name. It'd be Asclepias tuberosa uh, fireworks or something like that. So it has this, this sort of trade name in addition to those, those other two botanical names. And that means it's been selected for various traits. It could be uh, color of the blossom, it could be bloom time, uh, size, shape, leaf color. And this is where the science gets a little fuzzy. Um, really what it's been selected for can, can have a big impact on um, whether or not it's able to benefit native insects in your region. You know, if the bloom time has been altered, it might bloom at the wrong time to provide benefit to those insects. If the color has changed, it might not have the right chemical cues to, to draw in those insects uh, to pollinate. So as much as you can, um, you know, work with and plant the, the straight native species, uh, that's how you're going to provide the most benefit. Um, and then beyond that, as much as you can uh, get uh, local and, and Michigan genotypes, um, or at least regional genotypes. So native plants that have, uh, are from a uh, genetic stock that's, that's in our region. Uh, we try to grow only Michigan genotype uh, for all the species that, that it's still available. Um, it, can be, it can be tough to source um, Michigan genotype plants. And if you're not able to, at least uh, do your best to, to find um, genotypes that are, that are native to uh, the Great Lakes region. Um, then uh, it's you know more likely that it's going to bloom at the correct time and, and provide the most benefit and uh, interact with our, our native um, plant populations in a, in a um, more beneficial manner as well. In addition to that, providing a water source, if you can, uh, can be helpful for, for insects as well. Um, and uh, down there at the bottom left of the page, uh, the Xerces Society uh, puts out a uh, Great Lakes region uh, plant list of, of uh, beneficial plants for pollinators. It's a pretty good place to start. Um, and, and we'll be looking at some other resources later on in the presentation as well, but it's pretty hard to go wrong. I mean, just about all of our native species uh, have uh, you know, a handful or many, many insects that, that benefit um, from you planting them. So pretty hard to go wrong there. Looking at butterflies um, and skippers specifically. Um, so there's, there's over 430 species of butterflies and moths in Michigan. Many of these uh, species um, are specialists in that they uh, specialize on select plant species or genuses as their larval host plant. And what that means is that the, the caterpillars uh, of that butterfly species can only feed on uh, maybe a few species of plants or genuses of plants. Um, monarch is a, an example of these that, that just about everyone's familiar with nowadays. Monarch butterflies uh, use milkweeds as a larval host plant. And uh, you know if they don't have milkweeds, uh, they're not able to uh, successfully lay eggs and, and have a, another generation of caterpillars come along. And uh, different butterfly species are are drawn to uh, you know beyond the host plant thing when it comes to nectaring and and um, different butterfly species are drawn to a variety of of different flower colors and shapes, um, really kind of depending on on the species. So again, the more um, the more 
diversity and variety you can have, the, the more benefit you're going to provide. Typically, flat top blooms tend tend to be the most attractive, um, and uh, you know, pinks uh, seem to draw them in often. White, but I mean, we really see see butterflies nectaring on just just about everything, and uh, skippers as well. Um, Moths do um, some nectaring and, and pollination, a uh, lot less visible to people because because all that all that occurs at night. But um, that's a swamp milkweed up there in the top right that that monarch is on. Uh, so that's a larval host plant for one of the larval host plants for um, monarchs and a, a really great nectaring plant as well. They're uh, they're on it all the time. And again, similar. Two for uh, other pollinators, you know, clustering species together is gonna is gonna make for more efficient um, nectaring. And looking at larval host plants uh, more specifically here, for monarchs, uh, I mentioned milkweeds and common milkweed. Everyone's pretty pretty familiar with. Uh, you see this on on roadsides and ditches a lot. And this this is probably accounts for um, most of the of the host plant uh, usage that, that monarchs um, see here. Uh, it's, it's the most common of the milkweeds and uh, is also probably one of the big problems or one of the big causes of milkweed monarch populations declining is common milkweed is, is really common in disturbed areas, um, you know, ditches, roadsides, uh, fallow fields. And as we started to see changes in agriculture uh, with more herbicides being used, uh, farming became a lot cleaner in the sense that there were less weeds, less fallow fields, less farm edges. So uh, just less of this common milkweed. Uh, but there are uh, other milkweeds that are a little more suited to uh, the home garden. Common milkweed can be uh, somewhat aggressive. Uh, you know, if you're okay with, with pulling some, uh, if it gets a little out of hand, I, I find it isn't terrible. But uh, butterfly milkweed there in the, in the center, a lot more well-behaved milkweed. Uh, it's on the shorter side. Usually around you know two feet or so tall, uh, has orange, bright orange blooms. It's it's one of the few orange uh, blooming plants here in Michigan. Blooms midsummer. All the milkweeds do. Really likes hot, dry soils. Uh, it's great for uh, you know our sandy soils here, and and um, if you have a, a garden that gets full sun, and draws a lot of insects in uh, to nectar on and and, and pollinate. Swamp milkweed over on the right as adapted to grow in, in wet areas, shoreline, swamps, stream banks, marshes, but, but can tolerate dry soil really well. And uh, beyond this, there are several other milkweed species that are native to Michigan, world milkweed, uh, tall green milkweed, clasping milkweed. Uh, there's there are several uh, that are native can be a little harder to, to get a hold of um, as a as a consumer but but if you can find them uh, they're they're great um, for the home garden as well and again all all bloom midsummer the tussock moth also is a um, um, uses the milkweeds as a host plant um, and they they can feed pretty heavily sometimes on the leaves of of some of the milkweeds a few other host plants uh, here in Michigan and this is really just a handful. So wild strawberry, the host plant for the grizzled skipper, uh, pussy toes, host plants for American painted lady butterflies, shrubby sink foil, that's just, which is a, a shoreline and, and wet area shrub, is the host plant to the Dorcas copper, little blue stem grass, host plant for the dusted skipper. Lupin uh, is is really kind of a rock star of, of host plants. It it's host plant for I believe five species: uh, Carner blue butterfly, uh, two species of dusky wings, gray hair streak, and the frosted elfin. And then golden Alexanders um, over in the left is uh, a host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly. I believe it's uh, the called the native plant nursery uh, down in Ann Arbor. Uh, they put out online a, a PDF that's pretty easy to find if you just Google uh, Michigan uh, butterfly host plants. And it's a pretty comprehensive list of, of host plants for butterflies and skippers in the state of Michigan. If you, you wanna know more specifically uh, what species you might be benefiting. And talking about songbirds for a minute. Um, Songbirds really, oop, sorry about that. If I can get back to my screen here. So 
songbirds uh, benefit hugely from native plants in addition to um, being able to feed on on all the insects uh, that are present on the native plants. Um, you know, they're also able to eat uh, a lot of plant material as well. And pardon me, but really the a wide array of wildflowers, grasses, shrubs, and trees um, benefit birds. And uh, specifically, um, you know, shrubs can can really provide a lot of benefit for birds. Uh, shrubs, many of our shrubs uh, are fruiting, uh, like common elderberry up there in the left. And, um, you know, they provide a great late summer, early fall food source for birds. But in addition, uh, shrubs form really great nesting cover for many species of birds. So if you can incorporate some shrubs into your plantings or, or even plant sort of a, a shrub thicket or hedge, it's a great uh, nesting area for many species of birds, in addition to, to being a food resource. Many of our wildflower seeds are eaten by birds. Uh, that's cut leaf or green-headed coneflower there on the photo and on the right. Uh, birds go crazy for their seeds uh, as they start to mature in late summer, early fall. Many other uh, wildflower species are, their seeds are eaten by birds, the uh, coreopsis, the sunflowers, um, uh, Cory Ravain, uh, really, really many of them, anything with larger seeds can really provide that, that benefit. And, uh, and then uh, cardinal flower there on the left is one of uh, several species that uh, are nectared on by hummingbirds as well. So um, there's really uh, numerous species that, that can provide benefit for birds. And if you can include a water feature or bird bath, um, you know, that's, that's even better. So talking about more specific bloom times for plants, um, here we're looking at spring, which is, is right now. It's kind of exciting. Uh, some of these things are, are actually blooming or have been for a little while. So really your earliest um, plants to bloom are your spring ephemerals um, and, and woodland species. So ephemerals are plants like trillium, uh, bloodroot, trout lilies, which uh, we have all these blooming outside the greenhouse here right now. Um, and ephemerals really have it, are adapted to, to bloom early in the spring before the tree canopy has leaved out. And then they fade uh, as you start to go into summer. Uh, these can be kind of hard to source. Um, they're, they're very tough to propagate from seed. We, we really don't offer any ephemerals. Typically the best way to get a hold of them might be your local master gardeners club. They often uh, do plant rescue services where they'll dig up ephemerals from a site that's going to be developed or uh, turned, you know, cleared for farmland or, or um, a development of some sort. And they'll pot these up and, and sell them to the public. Uh, and you may be able to find them in, in some other nurseries. Um, and then other woodlands that, that aren't ephemerals, you know, typically do start blooming fairly early. Um, many of the species do. This is wood violet here and uh, is, is an early spring bloomer and um, the foliage does stick around all year. And then looking at some of our other spring bloomers, uh, more open ground species. Um, this is golden alexanders, which I uh, pointed to earlier as a, as a host plant. Prairie smoke um, is another early bloomer. And uh, you can see this one has bloomed. They're a little bit ahead of what's outside. Ours outside are just starting to bloom. When they're blooming, they're actually downturned. And um, now this is, is done blooming. The, the blooms turn, the blossoms turn upright, and then they'll start to uh, mature into long styles and long feathery seed heads, like you can see in that, that photo there on the right. Really neat. And that's actually pussy toes growing in behind it there, which uh, this is a pussy toes here that's just, just starting to open up. And uh, both of these are really low growing species and uh, can form, the pussy toes in particular will spread to form a, a nice ground cover, um, likes open dry sites. And wild columbine, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with this one, uh, can grow in full sun to full shade and everything in between, uh, likes, likes drier soils. 
another pretty low growing species and uh, will spread, will reseed and, and spread uh, fairly well also. And then one last one here for our show and tell. I couldn't resist when some of these things are starting to bloom in the greenhouse. Uh, this is starting to wrap up a little bit, but ours outside are, are just starting to bloom. This is wild strawberry. And wild strawberry is great as a mulch alternative or, you know, to use it as a ground cover. It spreads really well uh, by runners and uh, you can really cover, cover a garden, um, you know, in just a season from, from a few plants, they'll, they'll spread really well. And again, uh, you know, can, can be grown in, in full sun to, to full shade. Uh, they will uh, wilt sometimes a little bit and, and really dry uh, bright sun, but, but they're really pretty adaptable uh, to a lot of sites. And then that list there on the right, uh, you know, some of the other earlier, earliest species uh, that you're going to see blooming here in Michigan. Brown leaf ragwort is another one that I didn't mention. Uh, lupin comes along a little bit later. Spider wort, wort thimbleweed, uh, some of these others. So trying to incorporate some of these plants into your garden is going to, you know, give you give you some color right off the bat. And then as we move further along, you know, late May into June. What you'll start to see are uh, foxglove beer tongue, which there on the right, uh, blooming with those white flowers. Hairy beer tongue has uh, blue, and uh, it uh, blooms a little bit earlier. And um, and typically the foxglove comes on a little later. Uh, they're both uh, low growing and uh, can can handle uh, you know sun and shade, so so pretty great options there. And they're, they're pretty fun to watch the bees crawl in and out of them to, to pollinate. That's hoary vervain up there on the, on the left, top left, uh, a great uh, dry ground species. And uh, hoary vervain and then blue vervain um, both have the same feature where as they bloom, the, the flowers will, will move up that uh, stalk, that flowering stalk. You'll have just a clump of, of blossoms and it'll slowly move up the stalk. Uh, so you'll get a really long bloom time. And then after that seed matures, um, you know, birds, birds will usually feed on that. The Baptisios or false indigos uh, all bloom pretty early. Uh, wild blue iris, uh, spikenard, culver's root, yellow avens, uh, and then many of your fruiting shrubs also bloom in that late spring, early summer uh, period as well. Um, so great, great to incorporate there. And then down the lower left, that's sand coreopsis, one of our native coreopsis and the most common here up, up in Northern Michigan, another dry, uh, dry land species and another great spreader. Um, it, it, uh, self seeds really well and, and, uh, you can even, even mow it. It's a pretty, pretty tough plant. It'll keep coming back. Getting into midsummer. This is when we really see the most number of species that are that are in bloom, and you know things really really are taking off in the garden. There's always something exciting going on. Uh, starting up there in the top left photo, that's Marsh Blazing Star, one of several Blazing Stars native in Michigan. Uh, Northern Blazing Star is another that, and that's the most common here up north. Marsh Blazing Stars. Pretty well suited to, to wet spots, uh, shorelines, stream banks, rain gardens, but it also does really well in dry sites. In that photo there, that's just planted in our uh, dry sandy soil here at the farm, and it it does really well. Uh, behind that, you'll you see uh, some gray-headed coneflower, and uh, I believe that's some cup plant, or actually that might be rosin weed, uh, which is related. Um, just starting to bloom and then some bergamot uh, down there behind the marsh blazing star on the right. Um, all, all bloom midsummer. And then moving over to the to the right, the next photo, that's harebell. That's probably the most profusely blooming harebell I've ever seen, uh, but they they do uh, put out a lot of blossoms and they have a really long bloom time. They'll, they'll start early summer and they'll bloom into September. Uh, can take really sandy soil. I've even seen it growing out of crevices and rocks, um, you know, really tough plant and uh, a, oh, but very delicate looking and, and really has some nice texture uh, lend itself to in your garden. Compass plant over there to the right. 
and then uh, moving clockwise around uh, wild petunia on the lower right another great um, hot dry site uh, low growing usually about 18 inches to less than two feet um, and then horse mint uh, to the left which is is related to uh, bergamot and uh, very minty both of these plants are uh, so they're they're pretty deer resistant for that reason um, and uh, another you know hot dry site um, plant um, so all of these hot dry soil uh, midsummer bloomers you know really are a very low maintenance plants um, and uh, you know, very easy very easy to deal with um, from a from a gardening perspective you know you, you really don't need to water them or very little um, we will water our beds occasionally um, during really dry spells but as we're trying to get seed from them uh, you know, we want good viable seeds, so we want our plants to not be too stressed out. Uh, but it, it is pretty incredible what what they can tolerate. And then black eyed Susan there on the left, uh, pretty common uh, native flower. Um, you know, we even see that on on roadsides and in two tracks up here. Uh, spreads really well, reseeds really well. It's a fairly short lived perennial, but because it reseeds, it'll it'll tend to keep coming back in your garden. And then. Uh, some others, the milkweeds we mentioned earlier, cone flowers, um, some species like Joe pieweed, bone set, nodding wild onion, lobelias, um, some of the other shrubs like New Jersey tea, meadow sweet. Really, there's uh, uh, many species that that bloom um, during that midsummer period, and many of them will continue, uh, you know, even into to late summer and, and early fall. Um, Getting into fall wildflowers, and this is a, a really important time to make sure you're you're getting uh, some blooming plants in your garden because uh, you know we're starting to see monarchs uh, migrating. Uh, many other insect species are trying to uh, build up uh, energy before they uh, hibernate over the winter, so it's it's really important to have that food source there for them in the fall. So the golden rods and asters really are the star of the show this time of year as they bloom very profusely, lots of color and uh, really draw in uh, bees and, and butterflies. Um, I mean, they're just always busy with insects and I'll come out um, to take a look on a frosty morning and there'll still be bees clinging to the, the golden rods kind of waiting for things to warm up before they'll get moving. And uh, starting down in the lower right, um, that's a showy goldenrod you see in the background with those wands and then there's some New England aster in the foreground with a few purple cone flowers and then sky blue aster and uh, goldenrods you know kind of get a bad rap in general a lot of folks think that they're responsible for uh, allergies and uh, that's actually impossible uh, goldenrods have really sticky pollen in it doesn't become windborne. It can't become windborne. So there's no way for it to get up into your nose. Um, the only way it can get moved around is by insects. So um, it's just not the case. Uh, you know, goldenrods aren't responsible for allergies, but because they're so showy that time of year when other plants like ragweed that, that do cause a lot of allergies aren't uh, as showy, uh, they, they tend to get the blame. Uh, they're also thought of as being aggressive spreaders uh, because Canada goldenrod, you know, which is so common, um, does spread pretty aggressively and, and is something you probably don't want in a small garden. But many of our other goldenrods are, are very well behaved, uh, like that showy goldenrod. Um, you know, I have some that I planted years ago that uh, hasn't spread at all. Um, you know, we cut the seed heads off um, in the fall, which would prevent it from self seeding, but it, you know, it doesn't spread by by rhizomes or runners, it really kind of stays where you put it. Um, uh, there's some other goldenrod species that are really attractive for the garden as well. Stiff goldenrod, which is uh, flat topped. Riddell is another flat top species that has uh, grass like leaves that's um, more suitable for, for wet sites. Uh, and then some shorter goldenrods like gray goldenrod and hairy goldenrod. There's really uh, dozens of, of great species. And then the asters as well, you see a lot of um, options. Um, it's a uh, swamp aster up in the top right, which is a, a great shoreline or wet, wet site aster. 
uh, you know, we have asters for, for woodlands, uh, big leaf aster, heart leaf aster, and then asters for dry sites, wet sites. There's really a, a whole range of, of options um, and, you know, something really great to, to put in your garden to get that fall bloom. A couple other fall bloomers uh, that's in the center bottom there is bottle gentian, a really neat plant. Um, it kind of a wet soil plant, but but does fine in on our dry soils if you water it a little bit, um, or it has some shade, particularly in the afternoon. And uh, really unique closed blooms, uh, pollinated only by bumblebees that are able to pry that bloom open. Um, and then to the left there, turtlehead, uh, another really neat uh, wetland species. And then some others. Many of the sunflowers will bloom bloom pretty late into fall. Uh, sneezeweed, ironweed. Uh, there's, there's several others that that'll that'll bloom uh, pretty well into into fall generally. Moving on to grasses, uh, there's basically two types of grasses. Uh, the way they're classified, we're looking at either cool season grass or warm season grass. And most of our turf grasses and agricultural grasses are all cool season grasses. Uh, that's why you know all of our lawns are growing like crazy right now with this kind of cool wet weather is, is perfect for them. But then when things dry up in the summer, they really don't do well. Um, and you know most hay fields and, and pastures are like this also. Uh, they do most of their growing during uh, the spring and the fall, and they really don't grow well during midsummer. A lot of our native uh, prairie grasses here in the state are warm season grasses, so they're really the opposite. Uh, once things start really warming up in June is when they'll start to grow and then they'll grow, put on the most of their growth through the hottest months um, and start blooming in, in late summer or putting out their seed heads in late summer. Uh, so up on the top row there, little blue stem, big blue stem Indian grass, those are all warm season grasses, as is switchgrass. Uh, little blue stem is a, a great grass for the home garden, uh, two to three feet tall, uh, grows in those uh, clumps about like you see in the photo there. And it has a nice silvery kind of blue green color uh, to the foliage in the summer, turns a tawny coppery color in the fall with these feathery seed heads. It's really attractive um, and uh, a great grass to, to include in, in, your, uh, in your planting. Big blue stem and Indian grass and switchgrass are all considerably taller. Uh, big blue and Indian can get up, up to five to six feet tall on the right site and uh, you know, a foot or two around. These are all bunch grasses, so they'll grow in, in a bunch like that. Um, but uh, so they take up a lot of space, but if you're looking to um, you know, fill in a, a background or um, a border of something or provide a bit of a screen, um, you know, they, they, they do that really well. And um, they also provide great habitat uh, for a lot of uh, birds um, and insects. And, um, you know, many bird species will feed on, on some of the seeds of these as well. So a great, great thing to have, have in the garden. Um, in addition, many, uh, well, several of them are host plants for butterflies, but many butterflies uh, will also typically form their chrysalises on, um, grass stems. So uh, another reason why it's important to have them in the garden. They also just provides a you know, different texture and, and color as well. Prairie drop seed and June grass down on the bottom left, those are both cool season grasses. So they'll, they are growing very vigorously right now. Um, and, uh, and typically they'll start putting out seed uh, early summer and then um, you know, kind of slow down and start to go dormant. Uh, through the hottest part of the year. June grass is um, one of the shorter grasses, uh, one of the shorter bunch grasses that we grow at least, um, and usually around two feet tall or so, uh, maybe a little shorter, uh, a little bit taller when it's, when it's putting up its seed heads like in the photo there. Prairie drop seed, uh, a little bit taller, uh, two to three feet tall, um, stays in a pretty well-behaved bunch um, with those kind of graceful, uh, drooping stems, a uh, really nice one to border a walkway or something like that with. Um, and uh, actually has been proven to be pretty resistant to road salt and, and it's been used on, on uh, you know, 
walkways and, and uh, like municipal plantings and things like that where, where things are getting salted, um, it seems to not be as effective as some other species. Sedges are uh, sedges and rushes are all cool season. So uh, brown fox sedge um, in the top left, and actually right below it on the bottom left as well, you can see some seed heads on the on the fox sedge. That's a, a, a wetland species, wet soil species, but it does really well planted out in the in the garden. Um, you know, in not wet areas, uh, around two to three foot tall. Uh, forms nice bunches and, and tends to be pretty well behaved. To the left of it there in this, or right of it there in the center is Pennsylvania sedge. And this is a pretty popular sedge. We literally can't ever keep it in stock. Um, it gets about six to eight inches tall and then we'll, we'll stop growing. Uh, so really, you know, no maintenance, you don't need to mow it. Um, and it can take some foot traffic, but not very heavy, but some folks uh, use it to replace some you know, areas of their lawn. And uh, it does spread pretty slowly, but it can, it can take a uh, you know, variety of conditions, full sun to, to full shade. And then uh, some wetland species uh, over on the right, dark green bulrush and wool grass. Those are both uh, bulrushes. They're, they're great options for uh, shoreline projects, uh, shoreline plantings, and um, you know, stream banks, wetlands, rain gardens, things like that. Uh, their seeds really, really valuable for birds, waterfowl, and uh, they're they're really attractive uh, rushes. Um, and then oh, fringe sedge cool. there in the center is an example of one of our wetter um, wetland type sedges. Uh, there there are quite a few in the state uh, that. The sedges are are very numerous. There's many species, and uh, we're kind of always discovering new ones that that seem to do really well um, in the home garden. Um, and and pretty much all of them seem to have a place. So they're they're definitely a great great thing to look for. So getting more specifically into um, other steps you need to take to to uh, put some of these species in at your home. And the first step really is analyzing the site um, that you wanna plant and uh, starting with the soil type. Uh, is it sandy? Is it clay? Uh, wet, dry, uh, or you know, does it dry out quickly or does it stay wet? Um, you know, these are all pretty important things um, that you wanna look at. And typically your options are gonna be a little more limited if it's wetter soil. You know, you, you're, you're not gonna be able to grow dry species there. Um, you usually have more leeway going in the other direction. You can grow some wetter species in a drier site if you're able to mulch or provide water, uh, but you can't really dry your wet soil out. So, um, you know, you want to pay attention to that uh, before you're, you're getting ready to plant. Uh, and ideally, if you can watch that site through a whole growing season and kind of pay attention uh, to um, what you know, times of the year, does it stay wet or for how long, um, you know, and gather as much of that information as you can. Uh, clay can be pretty challenging. There are some species that, that do well in clay, um, but it, it can, it can kind of depend on the site. Um, some of the resources I'll point out at the end of the presentation here have some, some fairly good lists for uh, species that are, that do okay in clay. Um, but it can be a challenge for some folks. And uh, slope is something you want to pay attention to a little bit. Um, you know, if you have a north facing slope, uh, it, it can kind of push things back a little bit in the spring, typically. Uh, south facing slope, things uh, are going to often start blooming earlier. Uh, lighting is really important. So, you know, if you're getting how how much of the day, how many hours of the day are you getting light? And then, um, you know, what time of the day are you getting that light? Uh, afternoon and midday sunlight really is the most intense. So if you're trying to grow some shade species out in the open and they're getting sun during that time of day, they might get burnt. Um, they might wilt. They might have a hard time with it. If it's more morning sun and not so much in the afternoon, you, you're probably going to get, um, you're gonna, probably going to have better luck there. And uh, consequently, you know, you don't want to try to grow open um, ground species, uh, full sun species in the shade. 
Um, and if you can only get them sun for, for half of the day, if you can get them afternoon sun, it's going to be, you know, more intense, hotter sun. Um, they're going to do better and bloom better typically. And then existing vegetation. Is there existing vegetation on the site that you want to plant? And, um, you know, do you need to remove it? And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a sec. So this graphic here just kind of gives you something to think about around a typical house, how you might run into some different scenarios um, and how you want to plan accordingly. So typically starting on the, you know, on the east side of the house, uh, you know, where you're, if you're getting sunlight, it's going to be um, less intense and this might be a good place to put your shade uh, gardens or more partial sun uh, plants. The south and west side of the house is where you're going to have that typically more intense heat and sun. Uh, you know, unless you're you're heavily wooded there, um, but that would be a great place for for prairie plantings and uh, more butterfly and pollinator gardens and and really those full sun plants. Uh, and then the north side, uh, you know, might be similar to the east, uh, where you know you might only get sun for uh, you know part of the day, uh, as it's kind of first rising or first setting. Depends on how close to the house you are, but um, you know something to think about there as well. So moving on to site preparation, if you need to remove existing vegetation, uh, like you have lawn there, um, and it would be really great if uh, folks got rid of more of their lawn and put in native plants. Uh, they have a lot of lawn in the U.S. and it and it really doesn't serve any any ecological purpose, and it's a lot of work to maintain. Um, and they're typically out in the open where they get a lot of sun, and, and you know you're going to have um, usually a little bit better luck growing things there. So uh, getting rid of lawn or, uh, you know, maybe you have a garden that's been planted with species that you don't want there. Uh, they're not native and you need to figure out how to get rid of them. So you have a few different options. Uh, and really the, the most effective and quickest option is gonna be uh, herbicide. Um, and your, your options there are to use a glyphosate, which is a Roundup and, um, you can buy it in most hardware or garden stores. Um, and obviously you wanna follow all the precautions um, and instructions on the, on the uh, container and you know, protect yourself, wear, wear long sleeves, gloves, um, all of that. And uh, you know, stake out the site, mark it well, and to make sure that you know, you know where you're spraying. Um, I'll usually stake and then run the lines between the stakes um, so I can follow those borders and then work uh, in the middle. And typically, um, you're going to start to see die off within uh, a week or two. Um, and, uh, you know, ideally, you wait uh, really up to a month to make sure that you that you got everything uh, there uh, before you plant. And uh, I should note that really all of these um, methods, you know, they're, they're, it's not a quick process. Um, it can be really challenging to start from scratch and, and try to install a, you know, garden in the spring. Um, it's really best if you, it's something you can work on, uh, you know, a month or two before you're going to plant. Uh, there's some good reasons to not use herbicide. So there, there's other options that you might want to explore. Um, so cultivation up at the top. And that could just be uh, getting a rototiller in, uh, tilling the site. Um, we'd, we've done that here with some beds. Uh, you usually need a pretty heavy duty rototiller to deal with uh, turf grass. And um, you're gonna need to do it over a period of time. So you're gonna need to probably till it a couple times and then you might even need to get in there by hand and, and kind of fish out uh, rhizomes of grass, um, you know, to get it good and clear. But it, it does work, uh, you know, you can even, dig it up with a pitchfork and shake out the grass clods. Uh, smothering is a, a pretty successful option and that's basically covering the area that you're gonna plant. You can use um, plastic is probably the most easy to use. Clear plastic is actually the best because you'll generate the most heat from the sun in clear plastic, but you can use uh, colored plastic, landscape fabric. Some people even use things like cardboard. Um, ideally, you'll you'll cover that area through the hottest part of the summer, and ideally, you'd leave it covered for three weeks or a month. Uh, pull the plastic, let things germinate and sprout again, then cover it again to kill it all off. 
and do that. If you can do that two or three times, you're going to have the most success. Um, but, uh, you know, if you only get one shot, um, you know, a, a month in the summer will typically uh, do the trick. Um, and then burning is another option for larger sites to remove un unwanted vegetation and plant. The key here is to not rush it and to, to make sure you got everything out of there that you want out of there before you plant it because it gets a lot more difficult to remove undesirable species. Um, if they start coming back in mass, once you've already have it planted, your, your options just get a lot more limited. And then the last step before planting, um, one of the last steps for planting is to decide if you're gonna mulch or not. Uh, mulch does help hold in moisture and uh, it helps prevent weed growth. Um, it also prevents plants from spreading. Uh, so, you know, you may see that as a benefit or a drawback. Uh, if you want your plants to reseed and spread and, and really fill that garden in, you might wanna not use mulch or really limit your mulch use. Um, also mulching too heavily um, isn't really the greatest thing for our ground nesting insects uh, that need to get into the ground uh, to nest or to overwinter. So that's something to keep in mind. Your options, uh, bark mulch is probably the most effective on really keeping weed growth back. Stay away from the dyed mulches. Uh, we suggest getting some double ground uh, pine uh, bark if you can get a hold of it, which is it's usually pretty easy to find at most landscape and, and garden centers. Uh, straw, uh, we use on a lot of our prairie type plantings here, uh, you know, bed, beds that we planted with, with uh, prairie plants for seed production. It's probably not something you'd want to do right next to the house. It's not quite as attractive, but um, it, it allows the plants to spread. Um, I use just clean uh, oat straw pretty affordable and uh, it's easy to touch up every year. Shredded leaves work for uh, woodland gardens. They can be a great option. And then if you wanna look uh, at other options besides mulching, uh, you can plant ground covers, things like wild strawberry, which will fill in really well, pussy toes, uh, clematis, even sedges. Uh, to, to just low growing plants to fill in that area. You know, really, if you can cover the soil with plants rather than mulch, it's typically more attractive and it's it's going to um, you know it's going to be less maintenance for you to, to keep that mulch up um, kind of just depends on your approach and then the last step is uh, putting in weed guard or edging I would definitely recommend that if you're uh, planting adjacent to a grass area uh, where you might see a lot of grass start to creep in um, it really you know cuts that back uh, you can buy uh, plastic weed guard or edging that's designed for this purpose. Um, you can also bury cedar boards, uh, work pretty well. Uh, really you need just uh, something in that kind of four to six inch range to keep that grass, those grass roots from, from creeping in there. And uh, just talk about layout for a second too. Um, a question we get a lot is spacing. Um, and there's really not a lot of clear cut answers on, on spacing. There's just, you know, there's no rules. You can space plants how you want. Um, you're just gonna get a really different, uh, you know, type of, type of planting. And as a general rule, the taller species you wanna give more space and the shorter species, um, you know, need less space. Kind of a general rule of thumb for planting is something like one square foot per plant um, for most of our wildflower species. The bigger grasses, maybe something like three square feet uh, per plant. But again, you know, if you're if you want sort of a more specimen plant look, uh, where plants are spaced out um, in you know just in clumps, but but spaced, um, you know, you'll want to you'll be able to plant them further apart. If you're going more for drifts or mass plantings, um, you're going to want to plant them closer together. So uh, really, it's it's kind of up to you. Um, I suggest looking at photos of um, gardens and, and kind of deciding how, how tightly you want to space things. Um, and luckily, m many of these plants will, will sort of fill in and, and reseed. I should also mention deer really quick too. Um, so a lot of people have problems with deer pressure and uh, it's, it's a challenge and there's no real hard and fast 
answer because uh, deer will try just about anything if they're hungry enough. But as a general rule, um, your more aromatic plants, they tend to leave alone. So some of the asters like New England aster, your minty plants like bergamot in the photo there, um, and uh, horse mint, mountain mint, um, they tend to leave those alone. Fuzzy or hairy leaved plants, they tend to leave alone. And um, uh, other aromatics like, like onion type plants, so nodding wild onion, wild leek, they'll, they'll leave those alone as well. Uh, Wild Ones Lansing puts out a pretty good list for mid-Michigan uh, deer-resistant plants. It's kind of a good place to start with. Um, and, and just a, a Google search usually will, you know, give you a place to start. But um, if you have really heavy deer pressure, it, it can be challenging. Um, they also tend to leave most of the grasses and sedges and ferns alone. Um, so uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. So moving along to installation, I have a few different options there and uh, starting with seeding, uh, you know, just buying seed and, and using seed to get your garden established. You know, it's definitely a cheaper option if you're planting a larger site, but it, there's a lot of challenges to, to germinating uh, native plants from seed. Uh, they're unlike cultivated species, they haven't been adapted to be grown by humans. So uh, we had to pull out all kinds of tricks to, to get them to germinate. Um, if you think about a, a native plant, the way the seed matures uh, during the growing season in the spring, summer, and fall, falls on the ground, gets covered with snow, and it has to be dormant so it, it doesn't germinate right after it hits the ground and then freeze and die, or it can't rot as it's sitting on the on the ground under the snow over the winter. So typically they have a period of, of dormancy, um, all these native plants, and they require um, a cold uh, stratification period, a cold moist stratification period to um, break that dormancy. And that simulates uh, winter under the snow on the ground. The way we do this at home uh, here at the nursery is uh, in the photo there, you can see we just uh, have our clean seed in Ziploc bags. I mix it with potting mix. You can use sand as well. I dampen that uh, to where it clumps, um, but isn't totally, you know, dripping wet. And uh, we'll put it in the refrigerator for a period of days. So San Coriopsis in the photo, you see I have it labeled as 30 days. Um, that requires 30 days in the refrigerator stratifying, and then it can be seeded and will germinate, typically. Um, and you can find online pretty easily the stratification times for um, any of these species, if, if you Google them. Uh, some of the larger nurseries like Prairie Moon, um, you know, online, they'll, it's pretty easy to find the, the stratification requirements for some of these species. Others require even more complicated stuff. I mean, our New Jersey tea, we pour boiling water on it and then, um, then stratify it. Some species need to be chemically treated. Uh, we don't mess with that. Some species, we have some uh, high bush cranberry in here that I seeded two years ago and just left outside, kind of gave up on it and it all germinated this year. It takes two cycles of cold stratification, warm stratification, cold, warm, cold, and then it'll germinate. Um, so they can be a little tricky uh, to get to get to germinate at home. If you don't want to do the bag thing, your other option is to seed them in the fall um, and then let them stratify themselves. Uh, I wouldn't recommend seeding in the spring a species that needs that stratification because it's just that much more time that it could get washed away, uh, eaten by birds, uh, insects, mice, uh, what have you. So uh, really fall seeding is the way to go. There are some species that don't need stratification and can be seeded in the spring and will germinate. Uh, bergamot, horse mint, mountain mint, uh, most grasses. So there, there are some options there. And, you know, other downsides are just slow to establish and you have a little less control over kind of density and composition. But if you're trying to put in a larger site, uh, you know, they can be a, a really effective option. The next uh, option up would be working with plugs. So if you were to purchase a garden kit like through AFU for this plant sale, uh, that's what, what they uh, are. They're 38 cell plug flat. So those plugs in the photo there, uh, about two and three quarter inch diameter by about five inches. And that's pretty industry standard for native plants. Uh, you, another thing you'll see is the two inch pots. I'm not as crazy about those because they're not very deep. 
um, but they're uh, so they don't allow as much root growth, but they are pretty similarly sized plants. And uh, so these plugs are are a great option for planting because you know you'll you get they're they're cheaper than a larger plant like buying a you know a gallon pot or, or even a quart, um, but they're they're going to give you growth uh, right away. They're pretty easy to install on a larger site. I use a ball bogger, as you can see in that bottom photo, you just chuck it into a drill and uh, you can just go along and, and auger out the spots that you want to plant, drop the plug in, pack the soil around it, and you're good to go. Um, quartz uh, really are great for um, planting if you want to see um, some action right away, if you want blooms and color and more mature plants. Uh, we in most other nurseries, most of the quartz that we're selling are our second year plants. Um, so pretty much all of them are gonna bloom uh, that year. And uh, because they have all that extra root growth and potting soil with them, they just, they tend to be a little more resilient um, as well. Same with gallons, you know, moving further along, you're just gonna get more mature plants usually um, and, you know, see more growth and, and size right away. Uh, we've already talked about spacing down there in the bottom and then maintenance. So, you know, you want to monitor for weed development. The best time to do that is uh, kind of starting in the spring when you do your garden cleanup. Uh, that's, you know, your cool season grasses are usually growing. And then I usually just kind of anytime I'm out there taking a look at the garden, seeing what's blooming, I just pull whatever weeds are coming up and you can usually stay pretty ahead of it. And uh, hopefully if you did your site prep, it, it doesn't become an issue. Um, like in the photo there, that's what you want to avoid. Then you kind of have to start over. Clearing out litter in the spring, um, you really want to wait as until soil temperatures are about 50 degrees um, is, is a safe bet uh, before you uh, start really going, going at cleaning out your garden. Uh, many of our insect species will actually overwinter and nest in the stems um, and in the the uh, you know debris on the on the ground. If you uh, really want to trim some of the stems back and can't stand it, if you leave you know eight ten inches of of stem at the bottom, um, you're probably not going to be doing any harm. Most of those insects, it's really right at soil level where they nest in those stems. But uh, we usually wait until sometime in May when we start to see um, other plants emerge. And not only is this best for the insects, but it also is it's just a lot easier to get in there and, and get your plant material out and know what's coming up. Um, you know, you can divide or thin things that time of year. You're not going to trample something that's just emerged, but you don't see it because it's so low. So it really kind of makes the most sense to wait a bit anyhow. Uh, you can rake on a larger site, um, you know, mowing or weed whipping even um, can be can work well. and. Uh, you know, for a larger uh, prairie planting, uh, obviously burning is, is really one of the most beneficial um, ways to, to maintain it. Uh, many of these species have adapted to fire and respond really well to it. And most of our non-native species um, are, don't, you know, they're, they're really suppressed by fire. And you can even graze uh, larger plantings as well. Just really quickly looking at rain gardens is another uh, app great application of native plants. Uh, rain gardens are trying to uh, utilize a natural drainage uh, for stormwater or snowmelt and capture that water and allow it to uh, soak into the ground before it reaches surface water. And um, these have started to become more popular in uh, public areas, schools, and uh, things like that. They're, they really function very well around developed sites like that, where you'll see a lot of runoff from parking lots, roads, lawns, roofs. And uh, it's a great way to use native plants. Uh, the plants that you put in a rain garden need to be able to be saturated at times of the year, but then also dry completely out. And that, that can be a tall order for a lot of cultivated species, but we have many native species that, that really can handle that well. So it, typically to, to form one, you'll create a depression um, or work with a natural depression in that drainage. And uh, you'll, you'll then um, possibly amending the soil is an option um, to drain better, but uh, you know, we see many successful rain gardens where the soil's not amended, you just plant species that, that are suitable for that soil. 
besides that depression, um, one of the best resources for that, the Tip of the Mint Watershed Council, uh, noted down at the bottom of the page, they have a great page on rain gardens and it has some uh, pretty quick calculation features there to calculate the size of your rain garden based on the area that you think uh, will drain into it. Plant your more wet species in the bottom and you can plant uh, dryland species on the slope of the rain garden. And, uh, and typically, um, so that kind of, that depression is lower than the surrounding ground. And then it sort of has a bit of a spillway um, for if, you know, it fills up and, and surface water needs to keep going. But usually if it's sized correctly, it can hold uh, rain from, from most rain events and then allow it to soak down into the ground and it's taken up by the plants, so really kind of a kind of a win-win. Shoreline and stream bank plantings is something that uh, we're, we see more and more interest from every year. Uh, people wanting to put in natural shorelines. It tends to be uh, a thing that kind of spreads, which is really great. Uh, once a few folks on a lake uh, put in natural shoreline and their neighbors see how attractive it is, uh, where it tends to spread. And um, that's that's really a, a great thing. Um, many, many species are are well suited to uh, grow on our shorelines. You know, that's really an area that we see a ton of diversity in the wild. Um, so a lot of species have adapted to that type of ecosystem uh, and they really function very well there, uh, you know, wetland species, species in the water and up on shore, not only do the roots hold the bank in place, but they'll absorb wave energy rather than deflect it like a seawall or riprap. Um, you know, when a wave hits a seawall, that uh, energy has to go somewhere. Um, it either goes downwards and it scours the lake bottom or it goes out to the side and it erodes other banks that aren't, aren't armored, you know, adjacent areas of banks that aren't armored with a seawall. When that wave hits a vegetated shoreline, um, all of that energy is absorbed by the plant. Um, so it really is, is uh, much better from an, an erosion uh, prevention standpoint. And, and then again, just great habitat for all of our bird and animal species and fish that, that use those near shore and shoreline areas. Um, so a really great thing to put in. And there's a lot of contractors in the state that, that have started to specialize on doing shoreline work. Uh, the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership, um, which is pretty easy to find on the web, is a pretty good resource for, for information on that. And they actually have a listing. They do a training in the state and they have a listing of, of certified shoreline contractors. So I'd recommend checking that out if you're interested in, in doing that. Resources here, a couple books I'll mention, uh, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, uh, a really great resource on the benefits of native plants in your backyard and, and very specific information on um, native plants that, that benefit, you know, a huge number of, of uh, critters and, and um, this whole idea of how you can, can make your backyard a, a, you know, pretty exciting place and a, and a place that really benefits wildlife. Definitely recommend that. He has a new book out as well. I think believe it's called Nature's Best Hope, which is also a great read. Landscaping with Native Plants of Michigan um, by Lynn Steiner is a great resource for native plant gardening in Michigan. A lot of plant lists for different sites, uh, specific information on plants, site prep, really a lot of the things we talk about today, but you know, in much more detail, uh, really a good resource. Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Home. She has several other um, books out uh, all on insects, uh, native insects and their interactions with native plants. Really fascinating stuff and really kind of eye-opening. Um, it, it's just incredible um, how these plants and insects have adapted and um, you know a lot of the specific uh, traits that go along with that. Really great photos too. Um, I recommend any, anything by her for sure. And the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is, is um, I think one of the easiest to use identification guides. Uh, one of the benefits of, of growing native plants at home is, is uh, you know, you get to work with plants that are, are native here out in the landscape and it makes it much easier for you to kind of spot things that you recognize when you're out, out on a hike or out for a paddle. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's just part of kind of having that sense of place and enjoying where we live. Uh, but, I, you know, having a good, good guide like that can help you kind of ID those things and be like, hey, I want to try to find some of that to, to grow at home. So recommend that. 
few web resources, uh, Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network and uh, Go Beyond Beauty. Go Beyond Beauty is a Northwest, started as a Northwest Michigan program, but is now spread statewide. And uh, it is a voluntary program for landscapers and nurseries who uh, pledge to not uh, grow and sell or install uh, invasive species. Uh, so it's a good place to, to start looking for uh, sources of native plants. Um, you know, other nurseries that sell natives, they do highlight uh, native plant producers there. So, so a good place to start looking for nurseries or landscape professionals. Plant it Wild um, a group out of Frankfurt um, that at least pre-COVID um, hosted a lot of workshops and um, informational outings on native plants. Um, I know they, they think they still do a few uh, digitally, but I'm sure they're gonna ramp back up uh, when, when that becomes safe. And then a couple other um, informational sources that we use a lot, the University of Michigan Herbarium Database, michiganflora.net. Pretty much anything that grows in the state of Michigan is on that database. Uh, if it's there, you can find it. Um, great identification information and then shows you all the counties of occurrence so you can see if a species you know belongs in in your county or your area of the state and michigan natural features inventory um, mnfi puts out a lot of great information on on native communities in the state and um and rare plants and uh you know their the roles that they play in some of our our ecosystems here and uh, these plants in the photo, that up on the top right, that's uh, clematis or virgin's bower. Uh, it's a it's a vine, a, a woody vine, and um, is will climb you know climbs trees, fences. It's it's really uh, pretty pretty great climber. If it doesn't have anything to climb, it'll actually form a bit of a ground cover. And um, that's those are the flowers that bloom midsummer, and then uh, develops these really feathery seed heads. It kind of looks like prairie smoke, but it's white. Actually, one of its uh, nicknames is prairie smoke on a rope, and those seed heads will hang on it into winter. Really, a, a cool plant. And then down below that, there is is rattlesnake master, which is a southwest Michigan prairie plant, but does pretty well planted up here in gardens, and it looks a lot like yucca. Uh, really, really pretty wild and out outlandish looking native, but a fun, fun one to have. And that pretty much wraps it up. And again, um, please come out to the, the plant sale on uh, June 12th on Saturday. Um, it's gonna be at Rotary Park in Ludington with AFU and um, love to see you there. We'll have, have uh, kits that folks ordered and we'll be bringing a whole bunch of wildflowers and grasses and quartz as well as, as uh, gallon shrubs. So, and uh, excellent. Yeah, and if there's, you know, we can cover questions here. But if any folks have other questions um, that come to you later, feel free to to give me a shout. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out that the plant sale is from nine to ten for pre-orders, and then ten o'clock it opens up. So, for those of you that are interested in that. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions? I have a question. No question. Oh, okay. Yeah, Brenda? Okay, so uh, you had mentioned uh, several of uh, the plants you talked about were considered prairie plants, but by the map were not we're kind of at the north edge of that zone. So you said that they probably would do all right in the right setting here. Yeah, that that term, um, kind of a loose term, I guess is kind of generic term for plants that, that tend to do really well in, or that's how I was using it, plants that do really well in open, um, you know, tend to be do well in open dry sites, um, but are more, specifically those Southwest Michigan prairie species do do well up here. Um, you know, we, we have pretty much all of them growing up here and, you know, we're, we're pretty far North in the state and, um, you know, we've never had any issues. And even with, you know, with, with climate change being a consideration, you know, a lot of, 
a lot of folks suggest trying to plant species a little bit north of their native range. So might be a good idea in, in that respect as well. But some of those species that, that do grow on that prairie also are found up here in our barrens and savannas. So some of them are, are native to this part of the state as well. Okay. And then my other question was, um, any of the grasses or sedges that would be similar to mirum grass, like on beach banks? Yeah, um, there are some native, there's a native dune grass. Um, it can be hard to find, to purchase. Um, I know it's pretty far north, depending on where you're at, but the Charlevoix Conservation, Conservation District actually grows uh, native beach grass. Yeah, um, this would be further. This would be further north that I'd be interested in getting some. Okay, um, um, some so, other gr other grasses that do pretty well um, around, you know, maybe not right out on the dunes, but pretty well in, in fairly sandy environments would be like June grass, little blue stem. Um, the wild rye, if you can find like Canada wild rye, actually does pretty well. Um, I, I see it growing in dunes and really sandy uh, banks and slopes as well. So that would be another option. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, are you guys still on? Here? Yep. Okay. I lost connection. So uh, pretty good. It waited, waited till now. <laughs> are there any other questions? No, any other questions? Wow, I know it was a really good presentation. I learned, I learned some things also. Really yeah, good. Yeah, it was good. I I appreciated that uh, very much. Um, since since there aren't any other questions, I have one more. <laughs> sure. When I'm looking through that that list that was sent out, the things that most likely would be available, I have. Uh, kind of a problem area it's a the soil is poor it's pretty sandy it's a southwest facing hill that I'd like to get thing, things going on mm -hmm. um, currently there's a lot of milkweed on it just regular common milkweed so I don't want to totally till it up and amend and you know, start all over because there's some good stuff growing there, but sure. uh, just trying to add some things that would um, grow well. It's also situated fairly far from our, you know, uh, from where we could water. We can hook together three long garden hoses and sort of get water out there, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are there are a lot of species that would, would do well on a site like that. It wouldn't need water. Um, and if I would recommend, you know, either checking out another plant list or you could go to our website, our species list does have um, information on the species. Uh, so like the moisture requirements is what you'd want to look at. And I would just select things on the dry end. Um, but species that, that would do well, you know, would be the core, like, sand coreopsis, mm -hmm. uh, butterfly milkweed, uh, pussy toes, prairie smoke, um, many of the goldenrods and asters uh, that are, you know, suitable for dry sites, black-eyed Susan, horse mint. So really any of those dry species. Um, uh -huh. If you're planting them during a dry spell, you might want to water them in, it would really help. Um, but you know, hopefully you'll get a good rain. But uh, if you could time it with the rain, that that would that would be great. <laughs> but all those species are incredibly drought tolerant, and uh, you know, I see growing, you know, totally unaided and and really sandy poor sites. So mm -hmm. I wanted to tell you that um, everybody that are on our website is the list that we're going to have that Garrett's going to be bringing, and it also has that information: what kind of sun. Oh, great. And the soil type and the moisture requirement, that's really handy. And when it blooms, what color? Yeah, good information. Anything else? I'm well, not a question. 
but okay. I just want to say, Garrett, uh, thank you very much for, for showing up today. It's been very yeah. gloomy uh, in my location for about four <laughs> days. So <laughs> you've gotten me really excited to get back out there. So thank you um, yeah. for you thank and you. for putting this on. It was, it was great for me to join today. Great. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, Sarah had a question. Well, I was just going to add that um, also on our website, we have information about the deer resistant plants that um, that uh, Garrett had mentioned. He sent, he had sent me that list as so we went ahead and posted that on there. Oh, good. And, um, good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's on there. And then the other thing, too, is right now, you know, we are taking the garden flats as well as uh, grass and sedge uh, flats that are for pre order and um, uh, we, we are no longer going to be able to take the um, uh, flats for the uh, individual wildflowers. I'm just not going to be able to do those anymore, but we will have a huge variety at the sale. The other thing we're going to be doing with it this year is we have another nursery that's going to be working with Garrett, and we will have some woodland plants that will be available. So that's something new and pretty exciting. Oh, yeah, looking forward to every all of it. Okay, anything else? I don't see anybody else. Well, again, thanks so much, Garrett. Very, yeah, thank you. Thank very you informative. I think you did such a good job. There weren't that many questions, but mm -hmm. probably you'll you'll get some questions as sure. people think or the day of the sale. So thank you again. And all thanks right. to all the members that joined in. And we will see you around. Take care. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Yeah,